Hey, everyone. Uh, so my name is Pauline. I'm 29 years old. I'm a software engineer at Werksport in Amsterdam. I'm also Dutch. Uh, I'm actually a first time conference speaker. So uh, I'm very excited. This is bright as hell <laughs> compared to the user groups I'm used to. Also, incidentally, the first time I've done this talk without having a drink down me first. So this is going to be interesting. Um, so my Twitter handle is in the uh, upper right corner. If you have any questions or feedback, don't hesitate to ask um, at me, and uh, I'll be sure to respond. But to be honest, also, the length of the talk will probably allow us to have plenty of time for uh, Q&A afterwards as well. OK? So with that, I'd like to invite you all to get legit. But first, obligatory we're hiring slide. Um, <laughs> So basically, I work at Werksputz. Um, it's a kind of a, a, a marketplace for service prof professionals, so um, professionals who offer home services, gardening, paint, painting, house renovation, that sort of stuff, um, and consumers to meet. So a consumer will uh, post a request for a service, and we'll match them up, basically. Um, that's our career website. My team personally, like my own team right now, is in dire need of a front-end engineer with React experience. I mean, we're at a PHP conference, so not likely. But if you know anyone, please, please, please send me a message. Freelancers also accepted at this point. We're desperate. Thank you. Without further ado, let's go over to the order of the day. Is this you when trying to work with Git? Because this has been me for hours on end when I first started, um, to be honest. Just fighting merge conflicts, uh, trying to solve merge conflicts takes me one to two hours. And by the time I fix them, there's new merge conflicts because there's changes on my base branch and blah, 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 blah. I spent like half days like on end trying to fix stuff. And that's until someone uh, joined my team in a company I was previously working for and told me a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be telling you today. Um, so when he first came in and offered all these changes to my workflow, essentially, I was pretty skeptical because changes to your workflow are quite scary. Um, but it actually doesn't take that long to get used to these changes. Um, and I promise you, once you do get used to them, you'll go from this mode to this mode, which is the mode that every developer <laughs> strives to be in at all times. It's the lead hacker mode where you're just flowing over your keyboard. Sometimes it feels like you're playing the piano almost. You're feeling like such a boss. So this could be you. Um, and the way to go about it is to mostly, the foundation of it is to implement atomic commits. Um, so who here has heard of atomic commits? OK. That's actually OK then. Um, sorry, the foundation of this talk is atomic commits, so sorry for the people who are super familiar with it. Um, but for the ones who aren't familiar with it, it's um, pretty much was what it sounds like. If you look at the word atomic, you think of something small, something you can't split up. Um, so basically, atomic commits, I found, um, have three features, the first of which is that they're single irreducible units. So every commit pertains to only one fix or feature. Um, that is to say, if I can give you an example, on the left side, those two commits aren't atomic. If you look at the first one, um, you'll see it, it says, built sign of feature, oh, actually, this is just one commit, sorry. Uh, built si sign of feature, refactored mailer class. This commit holds the entire sign of feature, controller, repositories, templates, etc. And by the way, I noticed that the mailer class needed some refactoring, so while I was there, I did that too. So that's a lot of stuff in one commit. Now, to the right, you'll see that uh, all the things described in the one commit have been split up into their separate commits. So you have one commit that refactors the mailer class. Then you have one commit that does the entity, the repository, the persistent stuff. And then you have one commit that uh, does the controller and creates the endpoint. Um, so that's what I mean by a single irreducible unit. Uh, secondly, everything works. That means all your tests are green, everything's covered. Um, and your application doesn't break on any of the commits. So not just the last commit on your PR, any of the commits. Thirdly, um, every commit message needs to be clear and concise um, so that at first glance, the purpose uh, from the, of the commit is clear from the, from the message and the description. 
And um, so it's basically these three things. And that might sound simple, and it kind of is, but it will help you uh, fix a lot of your problems. And we're going to be looking at uh, each of the problems that it fixes today. Um, but first of all, it will help you keep your sanity. That's the biggest one for me. Um, so imagine this scenario, right? You have a PR open. You've been um, uh, working on something, and you open a PR. Then someone else is uh, also ben uh, um, branched off the same base branch that you're branched off of. They had a PR open. They've now merged it. And now you need to update your branch with the base branch. But you've got conflicts. And you need those changes. So who here, you've got two options, right? You, have, you can merge those changes in, or you can rebase. Who here would merge? OK. Ooh, that was very hesitant. Like, it started, it was like a wave of like, and then more and more people started popping up. Uh, and who would rebase? OK. So uh, just to recap what merging and rebasing is, um, this is the start situation for a merge. You've got your yellow branches, your base branch. Then you've uh, branched off, started working um, on your own branch, create a couple commits, um, and then you need the change from the base branch. So what you do is you merge it. And what Git does is it takes all, both your changes uh, on both branches at the end, the, the latest point, checks the difference, um, gives you the opportunity to solve merge conflicts, and it creates one commit that smushes it together, essentially. Um, it's a pretty simple process, so there's a definite benefit to that. It's easy. Um, but one thing it doesn't really do is um, keeps your commits relevant. So because you've got all these different changes from your three commits that you've been working on and whatever commits um, someone else has made, and you just smoosh them together as if they're part of the same thing, but they're not. And so then it also becomes impossible to have that clear and concise commit message because there is no one purpose to this commit, right? There's all these different changes that you've put together. Um, and you'll notice that the default uh, commit message for it is merge branch blah into blah, which you don't know what the changes are about. You don't know. And you have to keep doing this as you have to keep up to date with your base branch. So you keep polluting your history with these merge commits over and over again. Now let's take git rebase. You've got the same situation. You've got your base branch, and you've got the branch that you've been working on. Um, now git rebase won't take your changes at the end of it and create one commit. It will um, basically look at all your commits one by one and compare them one by, by one, check the delta, um, again, give you the uh, opportunity to solve any conflicts that you might have, and then it rewrites your commits, essentially, um, it, um, but still keeping the same commit message. So it rewrites history, um, which means that your commits will still have um, the changes in them that are relevant, it will uh, maintain your history and your messages. So it keeps your history a lot cleaner. This does mean, because um, every time you do this for every commit, a new commit hash is created. This does mean that once you try to push your changes, your origin will reject them because it'll compare commit hashes and say, oh, these are not the same commit hashes, so they're not the same commits, so I'm gonna reject this. So what you then have to do is um, force push every time. And force pushing obviously sounds very scary, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, but I'll get back to that. Um, so one problem that you can have, though, if you rebase and your commits aren't atomic, and this is something that um, I ran into a lot, actually, when I just started rebasing because people had told me, merging sucks. Rebase is the way to go. You have to do it. So I just blindly started doing it, but we weren't doing atomic commits. And what happens then is this. You go through every commit, and then you solve a problem, but because uh, the changes aren't um, relevant to one commit, they're all over the place, every commit, you'll have to solve the same problem again and again and again. 
So that can be very, very frustrating. And um, developer frustration will often lead to um, also bad history. I don't know if you know commit logs from last night. So commit logs from last night is basically a feed of commit messages where um, they've kind of um, crawled um, public commit message for just random profanity, as you can see, and creates a feed. So uh, oh, also, I've put some, when there's a source on any of the sites, I've put a QR code so you can just like take a picture, check it out later. Um, this one obviously isn't for um, research purposes, but it's amusing. So, and although it's fun, you can imagine you kind of don't want this history in your code base. Imagine having an open source project and it's just all this. <laughs> um, so that brings me to the next thing that Atomic Commits will help you with, and that is history. If you have a really clear and uh, relevant, clean history, it becomes really easy to revert back to certain points in time, and you can be confident that nothing breaks when you do. Um, so it, it gives you that flexibility to actually um, use your history and to search your history because all the messages are relevant, so you can easily search your history for a particular set of changes that you might be looking for. Um, and as an added bonus, some people choose to base their change logs on their commit history. Um, because if the changes are really clearly described in your commit uh, history, then a change log is gonna be ready as soon as you just take the commit history. Um, problem is though uh, that a lot of people use, start out using Git as kind of a save point thing. Um, some people call it checkpoint commits, and it's a very natural way of uh, committing. If you think about other tools, like if you're um, using Word, for instance, you're typing a document, and you haven't saved in like half an hour, and you're like, well, if this crashes, I've lost everything, so I'm gonna save it, right? And then you type a little bit more, and then you save it again. So it's like, over time, you keep saving, you keep making checkpoints, essentially. Same with video games. Um, you make some progress throughout the game. You think, if I die now, I'm gonna lose all this progress, so I have to find a save point, right? So it makes sense that people do this um, when they start using Git as well, because it feels like you're just saving, right? But that's not really the ideal way, I would say, to use Git, because you can end up with situations like this. So we're gonna start at the bottom. You'll see a commit that says that's the first commit. You'll, um, uh, you'll see a commit message that says, fix small bug. So you started, there, there was a bug, so you started working on it, you started fixing it, you created a commit. Then you run stuff, and you realize that you've actually broken something else now. So then you fix that, but you've already made the commit. So now what do you do? Well, I guess I'll just make a new commit. So you go fix the fix. So, okay, happy, you push it, you create a PR. Someone requests changes, leave some comments. Okay, well, I'm gonna adjust the comments. Git commit, dash M, address comments. And you break something else and so forth and so on. And then you end up with this situation. Um, there's a few problems with that. First of all, um, in barely any of these commits is the application actually uh, uh, in a stable state. So you can never just randomly confidently go back to any of, the, of these commits and be assured that um, um, your application won't break. Um, another problem is that most of these commit messages don't tell you anything, and they can't tell you anything because they, have, they, they don't belong to the same thing. So all you, all you can really say is address comments because that's really all you did. Um, and then lastly, outside of the scope of your PR, None of this makes sense. Like, when you still have your PR open, people can see the commits and see like, okay, this is what happened. But as soon as it gets merged to your, your, um, your master branch or whatever branch you have as your main branch, um, none of these make sense. Nobody knows that this was all to fix a bug. So ideally, you just want to fix the bug, right? That's what you, you set out to do. Um, so there should be one commit that actually fixes the bug, and you can go back to that commit and see what happened. Um, so how can you do that if you've already committed? Well, this is probably the simplest um, 
commands that we're going to talk about today is git commit amend. And it uh, just um, gives you the opportunity to make changes and just stage those, those changes and instead of going git commit um, dash m whatever, you go git commit amend and it adds it to uh, your previous commits and it gives you the opportunity to change the message and it basically rewrites that commit. So again, it changes the hash and you'll have to force push. So just to demo that, um, git log shows you two commits. It's gonna make some changes here. Got blot out text, you'll see it. Then I'm gonna stage those changes and go git commit dash dash amend. It'll open the text file with the commit message and everything. You can still change it. And then you write the file and you've just added it to your previous commit. So that's super simple. Um, but what if, for instance, you have three or four commits and someone's made comments about um, something that <coughs> pertain to two commits back or three commits back? You can't use amend because it's only, that only amends your previous commit, right? Um, so then um, there is such a thing as interactive rebase. Um, interactive rebase, you can do that just as a normal rebase to um, uh, rebase your branch onto another branch as if you've ju just checked out, freshly checked out your branch from that branch. And the dash i or dash dash interactive um, will just give you a little more control over how Git will rebase it. But you can also do that onto your own branch. Um, so you can go back and replay all your commits um, and rewrite your own local history. So in this example, um, you're just gonna check out four commits ago with an interactive rebase. Um, before we demo that, um, I'll just show you what that, um, what that shows you when you go git commit, re wait, sorry, git rebase dash i. Um, this is the interactive rebase screen. So you'll notice there's the four commits that you want it to have and they're prefaced by pick. Um, the top commit is the earliest commit and the bottom commit is the latest commit. Don't look at the commit messages, they're bogus, okay? It's not about the commit messages. Uh, anyway, the, the pick preface can be replaced by any of the things in the legend below them. Um, so pick just means I'm just gonna keep this commit the way it is and move on to the next one. But you can replace pick, um, for instance, by R for reword, which will open up the commit message and you can change the commit message. Then E for edit, which gives you a little more control. It just checks out that commit. You can make all the changes um, you want and then amend anything you like to that commit. Also change the commit message if you like. Um, then you have squash, which is a handy one. Uh, squash, so you can, you can put squash or just S if you didn't realize. You can use the short letter or the, the whole word. Um, so squash um, will take your commit and squash it into the previous commit, making it one commit and it'll still give you the opportunity to create a, a new commit message. And fix up is uh, kind of a quicker way of doing that. It just skips the whole commit message thing. It just automatically takes the first commit message and then um, continues on to the next commit. Um, uh, X for execute, uh, you can run a command. So this can be handy if, for instance, you want to run your tests or run code standard stuff like check if there's any linting errors or something. Um, you do X, you add the command, and then it runs it on that commit. Um, and D for drop, you just drop all the changes in that commit. So I'm not gonna do all of these, obviously, um, but for now, I'm just gonna do the edit one. So there's some changes, I'm gonna stash them. And then I'm gonna go into my interactive rebase, back five commits in this case. And then I want to edit the first one, so I replace pick by E and the fourth one. Then I write the file and it checks out the first one. I'm gonna apply my stash, so there's my changes again. Then I add them. And then when I go git rebase dash dash continue, it'll just treat it as a git commit amend. So you do all the same things that you could do with git commit amend, like before. Then it checks out the second one, it stops at the second one I wanted to edit. I'm gonna um, make some new changes. There you see the changes. I'm gonna stage the changes, and then get rebase continue, and write the file, and there you go. 
And so I've um, actually gone back to the commits that um, the changes that I want to add are relevant to and just rewrite those commits so it has those changes. Um, and that way I'm keeping my history really relevant and clean. Okay. Um, so code review becomes a lot easier when you have um, atomic commits. You literally can't do the code review workflow basically that I do if you don't have the atomic commits and I'll show you why. So first, when I wasn't doing atomic commits, I just went onto GitHub or whatever you use and I went to the files change tab because you want to see what changed, right? So it makes sense. And you have a whole bunch of files, all the files that have been changed um, for that PR in no particular order with no real context except for the uh, just general PR description. And it becomes very information overload. Um, you don't really know what you're looking at. Um, there's too much going on at once. Nothing's chunked up. And so um, not only is that annoying and kind of stressful to review something like that because you kind of start feeling incompetent because I don't understand any of this, um, but also your review will just be um, of a lesser quality because if you don't know what you're looking at, how can you review it properly, right? So with atomic commits, you can actually do this. You can go commit by commit. Um, and what I do is I just, ooh, I think I just covered my lapel. Um, what I do is I just open each commit in a new tab and just go through each tab one by one. Um, and the reason you can't do that if your commits aren't atomic is because, um, let's say, you'll go into the first commit um, and you notice something that you disagree with or whatever and you comment on that. But someone's been making these checkpoint commits as if it's a save game, right? So then you go to the next commit and you realize that the thing that you were commenting on has already been resolved or you find out four commits later. So it doesn't really make sense to do it commit by commit if not every commit is about one particular set of changes. Um, and with the clear and concise messages for each commit, you have exactly the context that you need. So you per commit, you, it's neatly chunked into relevant bits and pieces. So you might have two or three files with changes and it says exactly uh, what it's about and why you've done it this way and how you've done it. And then it becomes much easier and much more um, qualitative. I don't even know if that's a word. It sounds right. <laughs> um, then um, if you just look at all the changes that are in, in one certain PR. Um, now about messages, there's all these different standards that you can choose, um, but it's, it makes sense to choose at least to just pick one, at least as a team, but preferably as an organization. Um, some people prefer to, for instance, preface their commit message by um, uh, with fix or feature or whatever, um, so that it's clear from the from first glance what that commit is. Um, some people use Gitmoji, which is essentially you um, preface your commit message by an emoji because it's a single character. Everyone knows what that emoji means. Is that a bug or a, or a feature or whatever? Um, so you can do that or you can, um, what a lot of people do is they put their issue tracker number in their description. I'm not a huge fan of that just because if you put it in the subject, it takes up a lot of space. And if you put it in the description, then still if you ever migrate issue trackers, then that's not gonna be relevant anymore. Which, you know, on the off chance, it just so happened that, um, that it happened to our organization recently, so I might be biased. Um, but yeah, um, just figure out what you want basically. But um, I have found that this simple, kind of format for me has been preferable and it's kind of a widely accepted set of rules that we've got here that um, I like to keep to. Um, so this is from this blog post right here in the uh, bottom right. I do recommend reading that because there's a lot more really interesting insights and um, handy stuff in that blog post um, about Git in general. Um, so the first one is uh, separate the subject from, uh, from the body with a blank line. We'll get back to that later. 
Um, limit the subject line to 50 characters, just because it keeps it readable, okay? Uh, capitalize the subject line. Again, a readability thing. Do not end the subject line with a period. I'm not sure about this one, except for the fact that it just saves you a character. I'm not sure if it really makes it more readable, but I guess it sets a standard. Whatever, I leave out the period at the end of the subject line anyway. Um, use the imperative mood in the subject line, um, by which I mean, you know, a lot of people will go like fixed or added or adds controller, creates feature, created feature. Um, but if you use the imperative mood, that would be fix bug, create controller, add feature. Um, and it just makes it more concise, so it leaves more space for other stuff. But also, it makes it more palpable, or not palpable, like um, palatable when you read it, when you read something and it just kind of reads more smoothly. Um, wrap the body at 72 characters. So that's the, uh, the subject line, 50 characters and blank space, then body. Wrap that at 72 characters because if you don't wrap it and you just go <laughs> it's really annoying when there's a PR and you want to read the description and you literally have to scroll to the side and then back for every line and that happens. Um, so wrap the body at 72 characters, it just makes it nicer to read. And use the body to explain the what and the why versus how. So what I do is I use a subject line for the what, so create blah, blah, blah. And then in the body, so blank space, and then in the body I say uh, why I did that and how I did it. And that should give you plenty of context to help, um, uh, that should help give people plenty of context to review your stuff. Um, so let's take, for instance, the two commits on the left. The first one addresses comments about the test not passing and the class being too bloated. That doesn't read, it, it's kind of painful to read. Um, you, you, don't, you can't really look at it and see exactly what it is. Um, and then the second one, uh, merge branch feature 209 into bug fix 221. That's like completely unclear about like what are these changes about? Also the first one, to be honest, because it says, okay, you address comment, uh, comments about the test, which tests, which set of changes. And then on the, on the right, you see those same three commits that we split up before. And um, everything has a, a really clear subject message, um, a subject line, a blank, uh, blank line between it, and then the description underneath it. And um, if you then look at your history via git log, it really neat, neatly um, um, fits. Um, you can really clearly see at one glance what it's about. And also if you do git log, and this is nice sometimes if you do git log dash dash one line, it'll just take the first, um, the subject line. So it just gives you a really quick overview of the commits you have. And you can't do that if we go back, whoop, sorry, to go through all that. You can't do that with the first one, for instance, because it's already two, two lines long and there's no blank space. So that one line thing isn't gonna work. So there's um, some nice looking history, but you don't want to be like counting the characters, right? If you have that 50 character um, limit on your subject line, what are you gonna do, just count every character? No. So here's some nice bash configuration stuff. Um, if you um, just follow this QR code, it'll um, add some nice colors. It'll add git auto completion, uh, which is really nice. It does the, uh, the, the, wrap, the line wrapping at 72 characters automatically, so you'll just be typing your description, it jumps down. And uh, the title, it'll show you if the title's too long, um, stuff like that. I have taken this um, configuration and kind of edited it to fit my own needs because I didn't need everything, but you can just take it and fill around with it, see if you like it and uh, what you need. And um, that's made by this guy, so thank you, Luis Cabucci. Um, some quick wins that you get from atomic commits. So I've already talked about cleaner history, being able to revert, stuff like that. Um, but there's some other quick wins that you get from using atomic commits, and one of them is you can cherry pick things. So um, let's take that situation from before where um, a, you and your teammate are both working um, on a branch that's based off your base branch, 
and you actually need some of their changes. Um, and because they've been keeping their uh, commits atomic, you can just grab the set of changes that you need and just drop it into yours without having to, because you don't need their whole branch. You know, don't need all the commits and all the changes that they've made. You only need that one set of changes. So you don't have to rebase. You don't have to merge or whatever you do. You just pick that commit, drop it in, and you're good. Um, so that can be quite nice. And you do that by um, going onto the other branch and copying the commit hash of the commit that you want, then going back to your own branch and uh, just cherry picking that. So there you go. Just copying this commit hash, then checking out my own branch. So you'll see I've got two commits there. And I'll just go get cherry dash pick and paste the commit hash that I want. And then if you get log, you'll see it's just been added to uh, my history. So the next thing that becomes really easy is dropping stuff. Um, because every commit is one set of changes, nothing is intertwined, like uh, the example we had before where we, what was it, added a feature and refactored. What if you want to drop the refactoring stuff? You have to go back to that commit and you have to manually like remove all those changes, not great. It would be better if you could just have that one bit and go, I don't want it anymore. This actually happened to me recently. I was like PHP 7 proofing a, a class and uh, I was doing like the, the uh, typed arguments and stuff. So I was doing that and I was really pleased with myself and then I realized, okay, but we're actually calling some of these methods with the wrong argument types in some places, so this is gonna break, so maybe I shouldn't be doing this. So then I just went back and just, just got rid of that commit and didn't have to worry about any other changes being affected by that. Um, so you can only do that because your commi uh, uh, commits are atomic. Um, you saw the drop before in your interactive rebase. You don't even have to do that. It's actually much easier than that. So s say I wanna delete that commit. I say delete, I mean drop, obviously. Good terminology. So interactive rebase, and instead of putting the D, I just delete the line and write the file. And that does the same stuff. So you just literally go, boop, boop, bye. And then all those chains are gone. Super easy. Um, then another thing that becomes uh, possible, well, it's always possible, but that becomes super convenient is git bisect. Um, you might wonder why I've put an egg emoji. Well, that's because uh, bisect stands for binary search, and I find that binary search is um, pretty easily explained by using a bunch of eggs. So you've got a bunch of eggs, and you have a building. And you want to figure out the first, what, what's the first floor where you, you drop off an egg and it breaks? Okay, so what you could do is you take one egg, drop it off the first floor. Take another egg, drop it off the second floor. It doesn't break. And you keep doing that until eventually it breaks, and then you know this is the first floor where the egg, egg breaks when I drop it off. You can do that, and it works, but it's pretty time consuming because you have to go through every level, and who knows, if it's 80 levels, you might be at level you know, 77 before it happens. So another way of doing it is you go to the middle, and you notice that the egg breaks. So then you know that somewhere between there and the bottom is the first place where it breaks. So then you go to the middle of that, you see that it doesn't break. So then you know it has to be somewhere in the middle of that. And then you do that and then you see, hey, this is the first place where it broke. So this is taking you three uh, tries instead of, what was it, five or six tries. And this becomes even shorter when you have a building with 80 floors. It becomes so much faster, so, mu uh, so, so many less um, tries to figure out where something went wrong. You can do the same with your application. So if um, you've been working on something or you've noticed that there's something, there's like a button or something that's gone wonky and you're like, okay, when did this happen? You can go back in time and you'll find a random commit way back in time and you're like, see, this is where it was still fine. So now I need to find the place where it's not fine. What changes broke this button or whatever it is? Um, so you can use git bisect for that. Um, so this is git bisect. You go git bisect start, and it starts your bisect. You mark the commit 
that you know is good as good by git bisect good and then the commit hash. You know your last commit is bad, so you, so you go git bisect bad and copy that commit hash. Then it goes into bisect mode and it checks in the, out the, the middle commit. You check your application, see if it's good or bad. You mark that commit as good or bad. And then it goes and it iterates through however many it needs. And then eventually it'll say uh, bisecting, zero revisions left. So you know you're done. And then you go git bisect reset and it'll give you the, um, the commit where the change that you've been looking for happens. So you can check out that commit, see what happened, fix it, whatever. Um, so that's very, uh, a very nice bonus point as well of um, uh, using atomic commits. And actually, I didn't think when I learned about this, I didn't really think this would be that useful and I wouldn't use it that often. But I actually find myself using this feature several times a week these days. So it's actually quite good once you get used to it. Um, so before we move on, um, I'd like to remove some skepticism because like I said, when um, that person came into uh, our company and explained all these things and like got us to change our workflow, I was like, mm, this looks like a lot of work. And mm. so I'd like to kind of um, pretend you're asking these same questions to me now and just preemptively give you the answers that I received at the time. So, but, how do I call people out on mistakes? Because you're rewriting history. And before, with the uh, very first example that I gave where you fix the fix and you address the comments, you could see every commit where, ooh, well, you thought you fixed the bug, but you actually didn't fix the bug, you broke something else, right? So, but you can't do that if you keep rewriting writing history. If you just have that one commit that captures your application in a stable state, you can't see that that happened. But then, Ask yourself, why, what's the purpose of source control? Why do you want to point fingers? Why do you need to know that that happened? The purpose of source control, I find, is to control your source. Um, it's much more preferable to be able to go back to any point in time that you, that you want and be confident that your application doesn't break and that your tests still run. Um, it's much preferable to have a good overview of all the changes that, that have been made um, and everything's relevant. So to me, that, that seems like kind of a mind shift of like, hey, why do I actually need to see all that stuff? Why isn't it okay to rewrite history like that? Um, you wouldn't like, for instance, if you read a book, right? You don't take the oldest version of a book and the newest version of a book and go page by page and compare and go, see, you spelled that wrong that time. In the newest version, you corrected that typo. No, you want to read the most updated, most relevant information, so you're gonna get the, the, the latest version of the book, right? Um, then the next thing, how will this affect my flow? For me, this was the biggest thing because it seemed super just, exhausting to go into interactive rebase all the time and to think about where everything belongs and clean everything up. Um, so the good news is that it actually doesn't have to affect your flow at all. If you want to do those checkpoint commits, you totally can. Um, it happens to me all the time that on a Friday afternoon, I just wanna go home, <laughs> but I still want my changes to be um, pushed so anyone else can pick it up or I can pick it up. So I just go change, 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 stage everything, checkpoint commit, Friday night stuff, go back to it on Monday. That's totally fine. The difference is that that's on your private branch that you're using. Um, it's not on your public branch, such as master or development or whichever branch names you use. Um, the shared branches just need to not have those commits. So before you create a PR and before you merge, you just make sure that those commits are clean, um, and the rest of the time you can be as gross as you want with commit messages. Um, and this is actually pretty easy. So I'll take the example of the uh, Friday night massive commit. Um, so there's my massive commit for a day's work. I just reset that last commit, and you'll just see some changes there. Handler, bug fix fix, feature X, relevant to feature X. Let's see, git log, okay, the last commit has built some handler, so I know I wanna add the handler to that. So git commit amend, there you go. Then I see what changes are left. You see bug fix fix and two things that have to do with feature X. 
So I'm going to I'm just going to add feature x and relevant to feature x and create a new commit from that, just a temporary one, so git commit dash m feature x. Okay? Then I do the same with the bug fix fix <laughs> and I create a commit that's called git commit uh, or that's called uh, bug fix. So that's two temporary commits and then I go into my interactive rebase and if you cut and paste the lines for your commits, you can rearrange them. So I take the feature X, I uh, put it after the commit that it actually belongs to and do the same with the bug fix one. Then I replace pick with F for fix up. And then when I write the file, the rebase will just smush those commits into their respective commits and everything's where it belongs again. So that doesn't take very long at all and you can just do what you've always done and you're good. Um, so last thing, isn't force pushing scary? I told you I'd get back to that, so here we go. Um, force pushing is kind of scary, I suppose. Um, but again, um, if you're doing it to your own branch, it's fine. If you're really that worried about overwriting your origin, you can always just locally check out a copy of your branch, branch and you're good. As long as you don't force push to master, obviously. And um, the thing is, people make mistakes. So it's happened before in a company that I worked for where a developer um, uh, forgot she, uh, she didn't, she forgot to check out a fresh branch. She just started working and then force push because she assumed that as always she was on this fresh branch, but she wasn't, she was a, mas a master. Um, and then she overwrote master which isn't ideal and you can say, well, that was stupid, but you know, things happen, people forget. Um, so what you should probably do is protect the branches that are important. Um, so always protect master and any other public branch and any other changes, you just put them in via change request or pull request, okay? Um, yeah, that was it basically, if you have any other questions. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Go ahead, super quick. Oh, I've got a few minutes. Yeah, sorry, I'll we'll give you time to run. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, so my question was just around, obviously you mentioned a lot about atomic commits. Mm -hmm. um, what about actual PRs? Um, because I've seen a lot of issues where multiple PRs is kind of the tendency for merge conflicts. Okay. Um, so would you say it's better to try and bundle bigger PRs but with atomic commits within them or is there some other strategy for that? I wouldn't say bundle PRs because the bigger PRs get the shittier they get <laughs> basically and the harder to maintain they get as well. Every time you get reviews it will take ages. So what we do is we uh, create a story branch and just create uh, branches off of the story branch uh, like task branches and then create uh, PRs to the story branch. So we each have smaller PRs going to the story branch and then eventually when that's all done, then we create a PR for the story branch and just check if the history is all clean and all that and then um, merge that in. And then you can keep rebasing onto the base branch, the story branch. Um, with the rebasing activities and, and in particular where you would give the example of removing previous commits, um, mm -hmm. do you keep that restricted to your personal work on your local machine before it gets, so for example, if you're working in a branch with a couple of other people, you're working mm -hmm. on an epic or something, um, do you restrict that activity to just your work before you share it with the others? Because is that, does that cause danger so if someone picks up on that work and, and doesn't realize you're going to remove it? So I wouldn't be working on the same branch as other people, is the short answer, basically. If, um, yeah, I mean, it, I guess if you're pairing or something, it could, mm. but then I would say just have two different branches and base them off the same base branch. So as soon as someone else merges something in, you can just safely do that. Um, if you want to be messy, just make sure that you create local copies of whatever you do, and then you could work on the same branch. But I would say that's almost never necessary in my experience.
thanks for that talk. That was really interesting. Um, I've been doing uh, Git on the command line for years, and you've taught me some stuff I had no idea about. So that's uh, really it's amazing. Thank you. Um, the question I have, though, is um, obviously from your talk, you're a very advanced user of Git. Um, but many developers aren't, and um, I've recently started working with quite a um, junior team, mm -hmm. and they struggle even with concepts around versioning and why you have a master branch. Mm -hmm. like they're really doing the save commit approach that you talked about, um, or save point approach you talked about. What's the best way to take a very junior Git user and get them going in the direction to the point where you've got to? Okay, so um, surprisingly, I know this all seems like pretty advanced crazy stuff, but to be honest, when that guy came into my team and introduced it to the organization that I was working at at the time, I was also pretty junior. And it was still pretty, like, obviously, you didn't just throw us into the deep end. You would come by and go, like, we go, like, can you help me? I forgot what this, blah, blah, blah. And then he'd do it together with us a couple of times, so like guided us through it. And then before you know it, as soon as you see it done a couple of times and replicated a couple of times, then it becomes pretty easy to pick up. Obviously, you need to work on the foundations of why you have a master branch and why you branch off. Like that, you have to have that foundation. But from there, you don't really have to be a very advanced user to get used to this pretty easily. Don't worry, trust. <laughs> A uh, quick question around uh, when you rebase and you, uh, you're you appending your changes to an existing commit. Mm -hmm. um, so you're talking about that in terms of it's a way to get rid of the uh, superfluous commits saying like adding code feedback, fixing code feedback, mm -hmm. and et cetera, et cetera, that kind of loop of noise. Uh, so the question I'm asking is when you do that and you use rebase to append to an old commit, how does that look then, say if you're using GitHub integration and looking at PRs and somebody left comments on the code and then uh, you right. go back in, like, what does that look like? Okay, so um, usually when you push, the, the uh, comments will still be there. Once you, if you go to the conversation tab, for instance, on GitHub, um, GitLab, I'm not so sure, I don't think it's much different. But on the conversation tab, it'll just have, it'll still have the comments, but it'll be um, uh, folded in and you have to click show outdated and then they'll still be there. Um, but they won't be relevant anymore, so they won't be shown and folded out anymore. Yeah, I figured, like, I've seen GitLab and it looks pretty similar, so. Thank you. Was that me? Oh, no, okay. <laughs> um, what happens to cherry picked commits when your branches come back together? Um, what do you mean, when you reba rebased or? So say we've, wor we've been working away and you've got a commit and I want it um, and it's like after I've made like three commits or something and then <laughs> our branches come back together. Would your, whereabouts would that commit be in the history after, the, after our branches have come back together, been merged or released um, or Right, so if you rebase, I'm assuming you're gonna rebase here. I think it just compares the times of the initial commit. So, um, when you first made the commit before you um, added stuff onto it. So it'll just go in between wherever that is, as far as I can remember. I think that's it. But also if you cherry pick, it'll just pop on <coughs> at the end. And you can still choose to rearrange it by cu cutting and pasting somewhere else. Okay. So after our branches have come back together, would that, would the commit that I picked out, would it be in amongst your ones or would it appear twice? Um, the, the commits that are on the base branch that you're rebasing onto that aren't on your branch would go onto your branch. And then you push through your own branch and then you create a PR to merge it back into the base branch. That's very cryptic. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's clear. I think there's one more and then... Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, honestly, who was first? <laughs> so one more, because I still have one bonus slide, and then... <laughs> this is 
don't expect too much. <laughs> um, there's just with reference to um, force pushing. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention there's the force release, which is yep. which is a bit safer. It won't destroy anything that's been pushed. But yep. it, will, it will override your weaknesses. I'm not sure if this is me. Oh, I think I'm standing on a cable. Yeah, someone else pointed <laughs> pointed that out uh, um, last time I did that talk as well. And I've actually tried it. I couldn't figure it out. It didn't work for me, so I don't know what I did wrong. But yeah, maybe read the docs a bit better. <laughs> um, yeah, so, OK, 15 seconds. So if there's anything else, maybe just come up to me or, again, at me. Um, and also, uh, people kept asking me, like, oh, what's that command again after hearing it? Because obviously, it's a bit much. So I've just created a cheat sheet that also links back. I got into a bit of a blog hole. It links back to kind of a summary of the talk and a justification for atomic commits. So there you go. Thank you very much. Round of applause.